and Engineering Public Works Committee. Uh, I want to uh, start off and, and say uh, this is a uh, beautiful, for those of you who are at home and cannot see the exterior of this courthouse, it is as beautiful as I've ever seen it with the blue and green and the Christmas spirit. It is fantastic. So uh, an early Merry Christmas to all those millions in the audience. Uh, I am going to call on uh, co-chair Steve Piercy for the minutes. Chairman Kush, I would move for, for their approval as they are printed on the iPad. All right, fantastic. We need a second. All right, we have a second. All those in favor? All right, thank you. Moving on. Uh, we have Mark with building codes tonight. Mark, come on up. I'm Mark. Tanya is out of town this week, so I'll be giving you your report. I'm Mark, assistant director of building codes. Uh, let's see. Schools facility tax total for November $311,744.50. Development tax that we're still collecting some for November $10,500. Uh, let's see. If there's anything, of course, the year totals for the schools facility tax is $1,742,161. The development tax is $96,000. Uh, let's see here, what is it? Single family dwelling permits issued for November this year, 68, compared to November last year was 69. The uh, total year to date on the single family dwellings is 292. I think this time last year we had about 377. Looks like we're down about 80, uh, let's see, about 85 permits. Uh, we had 165 zoning enforcement inspections for November. We had on building inspections, we had 1,928 building inspections completed. And the average square footage of the single family dwelling now, it looks to be about 2,867 square feet. Mm -hmm. Any questions? 2,867 for single family dwellings. Now, the townhome looks like it's up to 1,995 square feet, but of course we don't, we hadn't really had any townhomes in the county, so that would just be, you know, during the city and Smyrna and so forth, and so forth. Mark, question. Um, y you know, your group pretty much has their finger on the pulse of kind of foreseeing the pipeline. What What's the, Building what's scope. Yeah. Well, what, what's the what's? Uh, I know that's a million dollar question. But well, right now what we're seeing is I'll step back over the microphone. What we're seeing right now, uh, Chairman, is that people are still building. Uh, a lot of the people that are um, moving new to the area, they're doing additions, remodels to these homes they bought. Plus, they're if they they're making contracts on some of those homes that they bought. The builders are taking little breaks. Uh, but they're not stopping. Right. You know what I'm saying? They're taking a little break, like we're not going to do any new starts for. But they're still selling, just not at the pace, that breakneck pace that we we did have. You know, so we've still got uh, one subdivision. I talked to an inspector over that area today. And he says we got they're going to start 30 new homes out there. So they're still being optimistic. You know what I mean? That we can keep keep it going. You know. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Anybody have questions on uh, these codes reports? Mark, uh, just out of curiosity, and you read about this in the news, is... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Well, I'm using this speaker. I don't know what else I can do. <laughs> close, stand close. up and yell. Yeah. But um, what about new homes that are being built just for rental purposes? Do we see much of that here in the county? You know, I, I've heard of, you know, whole subdivisions basically being built and being built for rental purposes. Are we seeing that? For rentals. For rentals. I haven't seen that around here except like in one subdivision about 
three years ago, there was a company that came in and bought all the lots, and I'm thinking there were 20 to 30 lots, and they built every house for a rental. Now, you know, I've heard the sales, and I've heard exactly what you're talking about, but I haven't seen it actually come to fruition in the county. You know, they may be doing some in the city that I don't know about, and typically, most of them like to do the city, but like I said, I know that a lot of these rental companies have bought houses, but like I said, as far as the builders who are building in Rutherford County, I've only seen that once in, you know, since, since we've been doing it <laughs> in Rutherford County. Well, the reason I'm asking that is, is for the other folks on this same committee here. When you look at revenues on single family homes, as far as taxes goes, you know, we're all uh, taxed at a lower percentage. What is it? 30? 35, 25, at any rate, businesses are taxed at a bit higher tax rate. In my opinion, you know, if you've got one or two houses that you're using for rental, you know, I understand that. But if you've got five, 10, 100, that's a business and ought to be taxed as a business. And I think that's something we need to look to our legislators and talk to them about it and say, hey, what can we do about this? And I'm not talking about somebody's grandpa that's renting out the house that, you know, family home, you know, we could draw the line, say at three, five, whatever we decided to do. But I think somewhere along that line is a difference between, you know, taking care of your family and running a business. I think um, that'd probably be a better question for the tax assessor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any uh, questions for Mark before we need to need to get a motion for approval of his reports? Thank you, Co-Chair. I need a second. second and a second from Anthony. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate Thank it. You very much. All right. Uh, Doug, yeah, Doug, come on up. This would be planning and engineering report. You have five minutes. <laughs> my best. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, Commissioners. And Mayor Carr, good to see everybody here tonight. Uh, just uh, don't have any rezoning applications for you tonight. Uh, we do have some ordinance amendments, so I'm hoping that these will be uh, a little less uh, controversial than what we uh, dealt with last month at the County Commission. Uh, we do have three ordinance amendments. Uh, the first one deals with zoning, ordi zoning ordinance amendments for regulations regarding tiny homes. Uh, this is something that our office and building codes uh, regularly receive inquiries about. Most of the time, it's whether or not they're allowed, if they can, can they have multiple homes on a property, can they be used as accessory dwelling units, which are like mother-in-law apartments, something like that. Uh, we've also have people asking if they can live in campers, recreational vehicles, trailers, ready for movable structures like Dutch barns, things like that. So we've had several internal meetings on this over the past several months. We've made a presentation to the Planning Commission and also brought some regulations to them for their consideration. And that's what we're bringing forward uh, to you today. Uh, I have the regulations there within your iPads on your agenda. I can go into as much or as little detail as you want. But to uh, summarize, uh, the regulations would allow tiny homes on permanent foundations using what's called Appendix Q of the Adopted Building Code. Now that's something that they'll also have to adopt through the County Commission because I don't think that's adopted currently. Uh, they'd be regulated the same as we regulate single wide mobile homes, which would mean you can do it by right if you have a piece of property that's five acres or larger, but if you have one that's less than five acres in size, you can go to the Board of Zoning Appeals and ask for a special exception. Uh, we would also be, we would allow them as uh, accessory dwelling units, again, by special exception, which is what we do for single wide mobile homes. And then what we would call ready removable structures, again, those are things like storage barns, Dutch barns, whatnot you have in your backyard or something like that. We wanted to make sure that those were specifically prohibited from any kind of uh, living occupancy because they're not designed for things like that. So the regulations, again, they're on the, uh, the page after my uh, staff comments. This kind of gives you uh, an overview of the changes we'd be making, adding some definitions, uh, making a change to the land use activity table, and then adding some specific standards for tiny homes. Uh, 
the Planning Commission did uh, consider these regulations during the Planning Commission's meeting last month. Uh, nobody spoke during the public hearing and after discussion they did recommend approval of these regulations by a unanimous vote. So would you like to answer, ask me questions now or do you want me to get through all three of them and then ask questions uh, at that let's point? Let's take them one at a time. Okay. Any questions for Doug on the tiny house ordinance? Is that one per five acres? It'd be it just, yeah, one per lot, regardless of how many um, that uh, you'd be allowed to have, the size of the property, yeah, I'd be looking at one. All right. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to the second. Oh, okay. Thank you. Jeff. Uh, we'll, we'll approve each ordinance and each report separately. So we finished this one, so uh, motion to approve. Uh, we need a second. Second from uh, Chairman P. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our next ordinance amendment. This is regarding the maximum unit size for a mini warehouse use. Uh, our zoning ordinance currently provides for a 500 square foot limit maximum for the unit size for a mini warehouse development or self storage development. This isn't meaning that the building itself is limited to 500 square feet. If you have like a 5,000 square foot building, what we're saying is the maximum is 500 feet if you were to chop it into individual units. That's the, the maximum that we have is 500 square feet. We're starting to see developments of this type, uh, mini warehouses, providing enclosed storage options for vehicles like cars, boats, recreational vehicles, those kind of things. And some of those are larger vehicles. They can't be stored within a unit that's only 500 square feet. So after looking at this and researching the issue, what we're proposing to do is just up that a little bit from 500 to 750 square feet. None of the other regulations we have regarding mini warehouses or self storage would be uh, affected, just this particular one. Again, staff did discuss this potential change with the Planning Commission. They did ask us to go ahead and bring some amendments forward on this. Uh, again, nobody spoke at the public hearing and they did recommend approval of it by a unanimous vote. Again, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chairman, I also remember the discussion leading to um, <clears throat> people who were moving and renting storage units. Sometimes they had to rent multiple storage units and this would improve that situation quite a bit as well. It correct could, could, yes, because they wouldn't have to get multiple units at that point. They could have one larger one. Yes, sir. Doug, do we have language that would cover this particular ordinance in the fact that you could absolutely not run a business? Yes, it's already, that's currently in the code. Okay, yeah. all right. Or live. Or live. He's right. correct. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. in there as well. All right. Any further questions on this uh, enlargement of the mini warehouse square footage? If not, I need a motion to accept. Move to approve. All right, thank you. And a second. Are all those in favor? Any opposed? No. All right. Doug? Yes, thank you. Uh, our third zoning ordinance amendment is regarding the removal of what's called section 404A, which is variable lot size and adequate infrastructure in the residential low density RL zone. The RL zone was applied to property in the unincorporated county that was identified as rural under our current comprehensive plan. The zoning ordinance was adopted soon after the comprehensive plan was, with several provisions to allow for increased density should property in the residential low density zone meet those particular criteria. Uh, what those criteria really dealt with had to deal with uh, uh, fire flow, basically. If you were in an RL area and you had adequate fire flows to support fire hydrants and also were going to use a step system or sanitary sewer for sewer disposal, then you could move up to three units an acre, which is residential medium density. Uh, D density, I guess. Uh, it has become apparent to us over the last several years that there should be additional factors involved when considering a development in the RL zone beyond just water availability and sewer. We should look at things like traffic as a, a good example. Consider uh, the condition of the roads and different things like that. Uh, following this discussion at the Planning Commission, uh, we were instructed to bring some possible amendments to a public hearing. What we're proposing to do is delete section 404A 
and mark it as reserved. So subdivisions approved with preliminary plans under the existing rule would not be affected. They would still be able to uh, continue uh, developing under that provision, but it would only apply to new subdivisions. Planning Commission did have some questions about this and how this would affect density in those areas. Uh, we responded that the higher densities would only be allowed at that time if somebody went through a rezoning application. So if somebody wanted a higher density than just one unit per acre, which is what the residential low density allows, rather than saying, well, if you meet sewer and or step and water availability, then you can build at a higher density. Now we'll have a little bit more um, control over looking at things like traffic, conditions of the development of the area and different things like that. Uh, if we were to remove this. So, and that observation was made that this concern has been brought up also several times uh, during our first round of community engagement with our comprehensive plan update. So again, nobody spoke during the public hearing and after discussion, they did make a, uh, planning commission made a uh, recommendation of approval by a unanimous vote. So I may not have explained that very clearly enough, I didn't, I apologize, but I'd be happy to answer questions on that. So there's some, is, is there still a, does this remove the HUD opportunity or does it give planning and engineering some uh, I, I don't want to use arbitrary or capricious, but does it give the planning department some authority to say no if the road is inadequate and what yeah, tool if, would? And to answer the first part of your question, does this remove the ability for somebody to request a PUD, a PUD zoning request? The answer is no. They could, that's probably what we would expect to see, actually. Does this give the Planning Commission the authority to look at other factors beyond water availability, septics, sewer, whatever, uh, to look at road conditions, to look at increased traffic in the area, to look at just the development patterns in that area? The question, the answer is yes. Uh, so the, the Planning Commission would be able to take those factors into consideration in making a decision on that application then. With what criteria would one, will that be published? Uh, and I'm not familiar with 404A, it's being deleted. Yes, um, right, it's the, uh, basically all it's saying is if you have water availability and you are, you know, the four prior that's hydrants. The 404A. Yeah, that, that's 404A. Yeah, that's 404A, yes sir, right. yeah. Is there definition, because you've just granted the Planning Commission or the Planning Department authority. We we don't have a traffic shed item, for instance. We don't have that. What tools are you going to use? In in, yeah. in 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 my profession, this is a watershed moment. It's a game changer. Is what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? I don't know if I'd go that far with it. Um, this does change the development potential in some of the RL areas. The majority of the subdivisions we see are either in RM or PUD zones, I mean, quite frankly. The tools that we would use are similar to the ones we would continue to use, yet yeah, we don't have traffic sheds or anything like that, no, but we do have the ability to require traffic studies, and we have a whole section of our ordinance that uh, gives an overview and requirements of that. We also, I think, would be able to make better use of our adopted comprehensive plan, looking at what densities, in the rural area, what are they recommending for densities, being able to use that as a uh, tool as we currently do when we look at rezoning applications. So this really, what this is saying is if somebody wants increased density in the RL area, they're having to go through the rezoning process, like somebody in the RM area would have to do. RL is that, or those areas of the county that by default weren't revised in the last comprehensive plan? They're just ag? Well, that, not necessarily. It's kind of the, it, the way it's away from a nose. Yes. They're, they're, when you look at a map, and I, I apologize, I should have had a, a map we could have brought up on the screen. When you look at the county, basically when you look at the zoning of the county, the unincorporated area, you're looking at 50-50 between the orange color, which is residential medium density, which allows three units per acre, and then the yellow, which is the residential low density, which is the one unit per acre. There's other colors scattered on there, but I, over 90% is one or the other. Okay. Now, when uh, those were based on the recommendations of the comprehensive plan, when we did that plan about 10 plus years ago at this point, what we looked at was 
the areas that were classified as either general, urban, or suburban, those got the RM designation, whereas the areas that were considered rural got the RL designation. So that's how that differentiation was made to begin with. And an RL could currently go through a PUD process. Yes, yeah, any property could go through the PUD process, yes. And the removing 404A, um, With, without the PUD process, what's the smallest is one acre? One acre, yes, sir. And they could achieve the one acre, that uh, yes. applicant. Yeah, that's a by right, yes, sir. If the water and uh, soils were there, period, you could go to an acre. Right, yes. I mean, provided they had septic and, and whatnot, yeah, it'd just be considered as a, any other subdivision that we'd look at. Just we would look at a minimum of one acre lot as opposed to, say, three units per acre, which Anything is 15,000 square feet. Anything less than an acre, you're, you're in a PUD no matter Correct, where. correct. Thank you. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. With your permission, Chairman. Following discussion on the site, a planning commission will need to formulate a recommendation to the Board of Commissioners. I'm, I'm looking at the last. Oh, well, that, that was from the original staff report. The area below it in bold and italics, that's, that was that's the result the of the meeting. That's the outcome of your. Correct. Uh, Everything else, yes. That, that's what happened at the meeting. Yes. Yeah, when I, and I usually with my zoning staff reports, I'll have a little something in there that says changes from the staff report from the planning commission are bold and italicized. I didn't do that on here, I apologize. But yeah, the, what you see there in the regular text was the staff report that went to the planning commission that bolded and texted, uh, excuse me, bolded and italicized text is what happened at the planning commission for your information. that help, Phil? Any further discussion on that? Does everybody understand what this ordinance is? I would need uh, a motion to continue on. Move to approve. Need a second. We have a second. Anthony. All right. All those in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Uh, who made the motion? I'm sorry. Who made the motion? Uh, Commissioner Phillips. Aye. Thank you. All right. Doug, what else? Yes, sir. And I just realized that uh, I kind of did things a little backwards. Uh, I've been doing this for 16 plus years and I usually do the lot inventory first and I, I guess I was so excited to do the ordinance amendments I just jumped right into that. Uh, our lot inventory for uh, November is uh, on your iPads as well, the available lot inventory. That has gone up to 980 lots. Kind of uh, continuing on with some of the discussion that uh, Mr. Russell had while he was up here regarding the uh, activity that we're seeing. I don't think we're seeing quite as many new subdivisions being brought in right now. Uh, we have seen quite a few existing sections that are out there being recorded. We had one that was just brought up today, as a matter of fact, and a couple were recorded within the last couple of weeks, larger subdivision sections. So we're still seeing that kind of movement. Uh, I don't, I'm thinking that maybe we're gonna see a little bit of slowdown in new submittals. And I'm not sure how long that's going to last just because of the fact that uh, we are still having pre-application meetings in our office we have a couple tomorrow as a matter of fact so we'll see where some of those end up going but the lot inventory with more and more lots being recorded and then the subsequent slowdown of actual building permits being issued it's not a surprise that the available lot inventory has increased so uh, i just wanted to make you aware of that and if there's no questions on that i have one other item uh, for your consideration and this is a resolution uh, confirming authority of the Planning Commission to delegate approval authority to minor subdivision plats to Planning Department staff. This is something that the state legislature changed uh, a little earlier this year. As of right now, staff is allowed to have a, administrative authority to approve plats that are either two lots or one lot that don't require any kind of waivers before the Planning Commission. I won't get into all the changes that were made, but the law made some changes to the uh, statute that allows staff to approve lots of greater numbers under certain circumstances. Most of those circumstances we don't want to do. Really all we're interested in looking at is rather than have the ability to approve administratively plats that only have two lots or one lot, upping that to five lots. 
and the reason for five lots is there's several reasons behind that. Some of the other changes we're thinking about making to our regulations, we're using that five lot threshold. Also, consolidated utility district doesn't require any kind of a will serve letter for any developments five lots or less. So only thing that really would be changing is giving us that ability to go from two lots to five lots administratively. If something needed a waiver, let's say for like a fire hydrant waiver or an offsite soils or something like that, that would still have to go through planning commission because uh, we can't approve anything administratively that requires a waiver. So really the only change we're proposing to make is going from two lots to five lots. The reason this is coming before you is because part of that new law that was passed by the state legislature this year requires that if this authority is granted to staff, there has to be a resolution by the legislative body granting that authority. So if this were just a subdivision regulation change, we wouldn't even have to bring it to you, but that is part of the state statute now. So that's why it's before you tonight. Any questions? Yep. Did this go through planning? I, I'd like to hear from, so you guys uh, approved this and, and moved it forward? If, if I could just make one comment, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, we've seen uh, probably, I'm not saying we've seen more, but it's been regular through the years that we've had a number of families that are subdividing pieces of property and, and, and putting two, three, or four lots on it. Parents want their kids inside them, those kinds of things. That's what happens most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, and they're routinely looked at and passed. And this would just give the staff the opportunity to go ahead and do those without county commission. And I think it's a, a good idea, but I also think it's a good idea, Doug, that uh, the planning department still report to the planning commission when they do those kinds of things. Yes, absolutely. Having been on planning in the past, and I'm aware, you know, there's a lot of stuff that is routine. However, I don't feel like this is routine. Uh, this is nothing that needs to be looked at, I feel like, by the full planning commission. Uh, what I would suggest to modify this is kind of like our consent agenda. If we said any planning commissioner or commissioner whose district gets in wish for that to be reviewed by the full planning commission that it could be, I could go along with it if you want to go that way. But other than that, I'm, I'm not ready to make that leap. Well, and, and I apologize. I, I'm this first time hearing this, so you know, I, I'm just kind of reacting to it. I, I kind of wonder how that might play out because a lot of the times with when it comes to plats as opposed to rezonings, plats are a little bit of a, of a different animal because you have to, they, if they meet certain standards, you don't really have a legal ground to say no at that point. So, you know, even if it were removed off of a consent agenda or something like that, you know, the regulations, they're either they're met or they're not at that point. So we actually talked about it, the Planning Commission having a consent agenda, but we went and we did away with that. Well, well like I said, this just gives us the ability to, you know, go from two lots to five lots. That, that's all we're doing. It's, that's the only change we're making, really. Well, with that argument, we might as well do away with the rest of the Planning Commission since it's just cut and dry. Well, not necessarily. Uh, what we, the, the, the law actually also made some provisions as far as what we're talking about are plats that don't require preliminary plan approval or anything like that. It means they're not extending any kind of roads. They're not extending any kind of rights away. There may be some right-of-way dedication along routes. I mean, that's not terribly unusual. But... I don't think doing away with the planning commission is even an option A, just because it's required by state law. Obviously, they have to do these things. But uh, at the same time, you know, what we're looking at, most of these plats, like I said, and it, as Jeff was saying just a moment ago, I did, and I didn't bring the number with me tonight, but uh, we kind of went back over the last year or so just to see how many plats this would affect. It was, I want to say somewhere in the range of 10 to 15, something like that, that it's not going to be every single plat that's going to be uh, up to staff at that point, but we do it now with one or two lots, so we're just asking to up it to five. So, I mean, if you're not comfortable with that, we'll just continue doing it the way we're doing it. And that's fine, and you know, we don't have any kind of uh, mechanism in place right now that says something has to go to planning commission. So, I just don't know how that would work. You know, something like that just seems a little unusual. 
We had a motion, didn't we? Okay, okay, all right. Any other questions? All right. Is this designed to keep a developer from buying, say, 100 acres and bringing you five lots at a time on a portion of that 100 acres and repeat till he builds out a full subdivision? Well, you see, and that kind of gets back to what we we're talking about as far as planning commission authority still with those with preliminary plans. If a developer comes in and they have a preliminary plan, it's the master plan of the development, that right there precludes, doesn't matter if they came back and said, okay, well, I only wanna do four lots. It's based on the preliminary plan. They'd have to go through the planning commission at that point. What we're talking about are just those plats that don't require a preliminary plan, don't require any waivers. That's, that's what we're referring to, just because of the very thing you're talking about. All right. Uh, and you would like a motion, Doug, to move this on? Yes, to the county commission. If Right. you feel it's appropriate all right so the request is for a motion to approve this resolution do i have a motion so moved we have uh, steve piercy do we have a second second from co-chair phillips or chairman phillips all those in favor of this resolution signify aye, aye. any opposed no. let's do a roll call Commissioner Piercy? Yes. Commissioner P? No. Commissioner Anthony Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Joshua James? No. Commissioner Dodd? Yes. Commissioner Phillips? Yes. Chairman Cush? Yes. Motion passes. All right. All right, Doug, what else do you I have? think that's everything I have. All right, Doug, thank you very much. You. All right, solid waste reports and updates. Chairman Cush. Yes, sir. That could be a lengthy discussion. Could we move the highway department up because all they have is one thing? Mary, Mary come on up. Here. Thank you, Steve. Did Mary get with you prior to the meeting? <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. All right, um, I'm coming to you this evening, bringing you uh, the county road book. Everyone, I oh. hope, got the orange book. I'm thinking it got in your boxes. Christmas comes early. Yes. Um, this year, um, this, of course, passed yesterday at our road board. Um, we are up to maintaining. Uh, as of November the 30th, there is 980.185 .185 road miles that the county highway department maintains. And that is an increase of 2.7 and a quarter miles over the year before. And this all passed our road board yesterday morning unanimously. Are there any questions or? Um, 980.185. There's 665 and change of county road miles and 314 and change of subdivision to make the 680. I'll make a motion to approve the road book. All right, we have a motion and a second by Phil Dodd. All, right. all those in favor? Aye. All right, thank you. Mary, what else you got? That's all I have for this evening. Oh, uh, you didn't want to wait an hour or two for? No, but I do appreciate it. <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And those road books are in our mailboxes, is that right? Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Bishop, before you uh, jump in, this is uh, solid waste related. I'm gonna let the mayor give a very quick update on our triad uh, RFQ that we had a couple of nights ago and uh, let him give us an update on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as this committee knows, um, it selected triad as the, um, the engineer and design cult consultant for enough to, to exceed $200,000 for um, a trans, uh, transfer station. 
um, triad has been in touch with both myself and now Mr. Bishop. And so I just wanted to let the committee know we are now beginning that process of negotiating that contract. And it is our hope that uh, certainly the next time we meet, we'll have something in place for you to, to review, if not sooner. So that's pretty much all I got. But I wanted to let you guys know we're moving forward. Thank you. Fantastic. Bishop, would now be a good time to let Michael chat about the uh, grant potential, or do you want to save that for the yeah, Absolutely. All right. You want to you want to kind of uh, oh, sure. set this up and then pass the ball to Michael. So, uh, with the construction of the transfer station, there are some options uh, available from uh, that have been brought to our attention from from the federal government uh, for some grant opportunities. Uh, I'd add no match grant opportunities. Uh, Michael has some, some more details on that he'd like to share with us. So we have the potential to apply for a grant from the EPA. This grant will be the Solid Waste Infrastructure for Recycling Grant Program from the EPA. This is The grant period for this is three years, so it does kind of fall in line with kind of what we're looking at uh, for the transfer station. Now I know you don't want a transfer station in three years, but construction, all of that stuff falls into this time frame. The minimum award for this grant would be $500,000. The maximum award would be $4 million. Now we have to have an intent to apply by next Thursday the 15th. Um, so that's why we wanted to bring it to you tonight to, to allow us to proceed with an intent to apply for this grant. Um, and then if, if y'all approve, it will go on to budget and subsequently on to the full commission for intent for us to apply for this money. Um, let me give one other uh, description. This grant is for to establish, increase, expand, or optimize collection and improve materials management infrastructure to reduce contamination of recycle, in, in the recycled material stream and to identify, establish, and improve in markets for the use of recycled materials. So we feel that you know this, this would be somewhat applicable to what we're doing, so we would like permission to apply and um, see if we can obtain this grant money. Yes, Joshua James. That minimum maximum, uh, 500,000 to 4 million, is that annual or total for the three That's total family? and if we are awarded. Um, so this grant spans um, across the entire country. Um, the total amount of this grant, not coming to us, is $40 million. And so they're gonna pick uh, recipients across the country um, in high growth areas, especially with, um, people that have large metropolitan governments that have an influx of solid waste material. Um, and so we feel with us being in the realm of uh, Metro Nashville that, that we would kind of qualify for this. Is not, not that it really matters because free money is free money, but is there a matching, is there a co-match 50, 50, 80, There's 20? a no, no match to this. Okay, gotcha. Phil. Is there a downside to, um, applying, could there be some strings attached that would compel us to add some recycling components too, too soon? Or, because our first thought was to dump and push. And is that sufficient to get well, the grant? Well, to apply, the answer is no. So we won't know. So this vote tonight would be to apply. Now, could there be? Yes, that there could be. Now, that's when we would bring this back to you. Bishop and the mayor would bring this back and we'd say, hey, do y'all still want to proceed? You know, it could be that they want us, and Bishop can speak more to this, because we talked about this the other day, some type of specific, uh, what did you call it, a, a line or a? Sorting line? Uh, yes. There, there may be some, some uh, once we do, so this is initially just to get the intent to put our thumb in the book, and then I think it's the 16th of the Jan. The 15th next Thursday to apply. January date is the 16th, is that correct? Yes, I think. We're asking permission to kick the tires, not to buy, yeah. okay? So and we'll, and we, we, gotta, we gotta know more, so that's what this is, is permission so we can know more. We'll have something by the next uh, committee meeting that'll give us a little more detail about some of the options. Do you need a motion to, uh, I'd like to make a motion to grant the appropriate elected officials authority to apply for this grant. Send it to budget. Second. Send it to budget. Anthony, you were the second? Okay. All right. Uh, oh, roll call? Yeah. Since there's money. Free money. Commissioner Payne? Yes. Commissioner Piercy? Yes. 
Commissioner Anthony Johnson? Aye. Commissioner James? Yes. Commissioner Dodd? Yes. Commissioner Phillips? Yes. Chairman Cush? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Bishop, thank did thank you, you, Michael. Thank you, you would Commissioner. have this information by the next committee meeting for public works or our next committee meeting? Our next, our next public works meeting that we'll have. I should, I'd ask more information on what, if there are any potential strings and, and things attached to it. Will it not have to be voted on to accept it if we are granted the grant? I believe that would be the proper procedure, yes. That's what I thought. All right, Bishop, now you may start your reports. Well, good evening, commissioners. Um, Mayor and Rachel. Uh, last month, Rutherford County Landfill accepted 155 tons of brush for a revenue of $4,682. We also managed 14, 148 tires for a revenue of $1,607. The total combined revenue uh, was $6,289 for the month of November at the landfill. Rutherford County Solid Waste disposed of 2,879.16 tons of waste from all sources in the month of November. 2,297.21 tons were from the convenience centers and 581.95 were from schools. We recycled 368.58 tons from all sources, and that's a diversion of 12.8 for the month of, of November. Any questions? The total for the disposal or the, the total, trash total uh, trash collected was 2,879.16 tons. What was the majority of the material recycled? Was it cardboard, plastic? The, the larger bulk, of, because this is measured by weight, is the steel and the metal that we collect. But by, by just loads and volumes, cardboard is the most, most uh, recycled commodity. Is cardboard still a depressed market? Cardboard is still depressed. It's, uh, it's starting to eke up slowly, but it's still not, not looking real great. Can you give us an amount of trash that was collected excluding the steel and the metals that you collected for the month of November? That, that, that 2,800 is just garbage. It doesn't include trash. the recycling. Recycling is five, is 368.58 uh, tons. That's the that's separate from them. But it's 2,000 tons for the month. 2,879, yes, sir. Thank you. Go on. That concludes this, uh, the report. I have uh, some uh, s presentation similar to last, last month's with some updates on our activities out there in the county. S but you have, do you have, an, you have an additional report or, you, or is the rest just an update? The rest is just the update like All I right, let's go get, ahead and get a motion to approve that report. And a second, all right. All those in favor? All right, all right, Bishop, go ahead. Okay. So we're gonna talk about uh, the high capacity compactors today and uh, a convenience center update. This slide will look real familiar. So the Elmville Road Convenience Center uh, has a high capacity compactor. I'm getting a lot of calls from Elmville Road uh, as, as uh, Commissioner James could, can attest to. Um, the, what we're, what's going on right now is I'm in data collection and kind of watching our backs mode with these new compactors. I want to make sure that they're operating effectively, that, they're, that they're, we don't have any maintenance issues. When they first went online, there were some uh, hydraulic uh, fitting issues that we had to address, and then there's some, uh, some, some things that we're dealing with when it comes to the, the stresses of the compactors against the boxes that we purchased. So we're, we're, uh, we're working th those details out, but one of the things that I'm not willing to do is compromise our ability to completely collect uh, garbage at these, at these facilities. So what I've done is I, in an effort for redundancy, I've shut down the secondary compactors um, in, in case there's a shutdown of the high capacity compactors until I'm confident they're gonna be up and, and available. This has caused, uh, in Elmville Road is probably the worst case currently, um, their, their queuing is, is getting, has been quite long. I'm working with my staff at the location to try to come up with methods to try to help them 
uh, serpentine queue inside the, the lot that's there at the old, uh, old community center. Um, and we're, rec we're re requesting and recommending that citizens that, that don't have time to wait can go to one of the other centers that's either at Weekly or, Ro or uh, Rockvale. Those are the two next closest. Uh, Eagleville is also in that, that sphere. Um, the compactors themselves are, are working efficiently. I'm seeing uh, tonnages in the 17 and 18 range pu per pull. Um, things are looking great when it comes to uh, our, the amount of material we'll be able to get and the amount of, of load, the, the reduction in the loads, load counts. As you know, or if you remember from last year, this is a super high volume uh, time of the year for us and, uh, and I wanna make sure that everything's running real smooth as we go into the next few weeks. And so, so far everything's looking looking pretty positive with the exception of the queuing time. So Craner Road, uh, that center is, is, yes sir. If I may, before you go past mm -hmm. Ample Road, what are your plans as far as the line, the queuing? I know right now they kind of will, will circle around in that parking lot, but beyond that, they also back up both ways on the road, blocking neighbors and driveways and so forth. Uh, in some instances, could take over half an hour for somebody to either get home or just to get out of their driveway. And I'm, that's a lot of the calls I'm getting about. Mm -hmm. What are your plans to curb that? So I'm gonna answer this as, as directly as I can. It's my plan to keep the site safe but people need to, to exercise a bit of, of understanding, patience, and caution. If they're pulling up and, there's, and the parking lot's full, they need to go on to one of the other 14 centers or come back at a time when the lot's not full. Um, the Almaville, Row, Almaville Center in particular is a challenge because it is way too small for the amount of population that are out there. Um, when I have two operating uh, compactors at certain parts of the year, I'm in the same situation. I've got people queuing out into the road. And I am, uh, you know, I am concerned that someone's gonna be injured, that somebody's gonna be locked in their home, that, that they're not gonna be able to exit their driveway. We experienced this last year during this period of time as well. Um, what, you know, the, I get a lot of calls saying, well, the obvious answer would be turn on the other compactor. Well, at the volumes that we're going, I can fill up that compactor in four hours. If I can't get a truck out there to empty that compactor, I have two full compactors, people in the parking lot and on the road that are waiting for a compactor that can't get serviced. So that's the, the double-edged sword of dealing with, with a center that's way over capacity. So I just ask that, uh, you know, the citizenry that if they get there and they see the line is long and it's going out into the street, um, you know, we don't park in the street. That's a, that's a state highway. Go down to the road, come back later, um, you know, wait till, till another time or, 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 or call our office and find out if there's another option for them. Bishop, on that, is there a way, uh, particularly this time of year, that at that particular center that we can post some information specifically about a, another convenience center that is close by so that when they pull up and they see a long line, they may can see some information or be alerted to some information that it, that can direct them somewhere else. Does that make sense? So yeah, it, yes, it, yes it does, Mayor. The, the issue with the signage is the location of the signage would be on the fence, which is really deep within the queuing area. But what I'm, what I'm proposing to do with our staff is to have a staff member, member that goes out there and does two things, helps the, the line get serpentined and notify folks as they come in there that they have other options that are, you know, Weekly Lane is just a few miles down the road and, and Rockvale is, is as well. Um, one of the things, uh, the benefits that we have here in this county with having 14 convenience centers is that you're really uh, at maximum about t no more than 20 minutes away from the, the furthest convenience center. I can get during heavy traffic times between convenience centers within no, no longer than, than 20 minutes. I know that's an inconvenience. Um, when we're dealing with, with this time of year, that's, that's especially something we need to consider. We're working on a model with these convenience centers that, that you know, really isn't, in some centers worse than others, isn't prepared to handle the volume of the folks. Is that all on that? So Craner Road is operating uh, very well. I'm, I'm finding that the data coming back from the smaller single compactor centers as they were before is excellent um, as far as their ability to, uh, to compact uh, more, not only municipal solid waste, but uh, uh, but the some of the larger bulk items that we're 
we're collecting as well. They're getting in these compactors and they're crunching up well. Um, I'm really happy with the way Craner's running right now. I wish I could model a few other centers to run as well as that one is. Um, Sand Hill is yet another convenient center that I'm having some, some issues with traffic and I've, I've been having issues with traffic for the year that I've been here when it comes to that center and its location. It's just sheer volume that it has. Um, the, so what, what in March, the second round of compactors are due to be arri uh, to arrived. What the data is looking like now is I will be placing a, a second high capacity compactor in, at both the Sand Hill and the Elmville Road locations just because of their, their volume and their inability to, to manage with, with, with that little degree of redundancy that we have currently. Um, there is always going to be a traffic problem at Sand Hill. Uh, there's 49,000 citizens that are going to one center. So um, the, the, I have spoke with, uh, with Mayor Cole. Um, he's got a proposal to try to work on directing traffic to where it only comes in from one direction to avoid some of the bottleneck that happens as people try to come in both directions. Uh, he uh, called and asked what my thoughts were on this. I really appreciate that. I'm 100% in support of that um, because when we do get in high volume, periods of time, we, we do get, citizens get in arguments, uh, there's potential for accident and injury uh, when they're coming in from both directions. Also, if, when the lines queue in both directions, it's really difficult and challenging for me to get my trucks in there to swap out containers to be able to make sure that the center stays open. Um, he has offered to uh, have a, a, a police officer there to direct traffic, tell things can get in order, so um, I'm interested to hear back on him. On, uh, on when they plan to implement that. And uh, I'm encouraged that maybe that will help, um, at least in the short term, to try to get some of the traffic issues happening there. And then again, Bradable Road uh, Center is, uh, I, I would liken that to, uh, the, to the Craner Road Center with its efficiency. So the single compactor centers, uh, when, with these high capacity, they're really, it really works well with these, um, these well. And I, I'm confident that it's going to work well in the larger volume centers as well once we have that, that, that redundancy and have both of those operational. I am gaining confidence in their reliability since we've been using them for a month. So let's move on to the, to the convenience center construction. This is the Leanna Center. As you can see, uh, buildings are erected, pads are poured. They're in the process of, the weather's kind of st stymied them, but they're in the process of, of working on uh, framing up and building the ramps for the, for the ramp system. They've got the culvert there and the pipe there for the, for the drainage around the ramps. Um, I took these pictures this morning, so uh, um, you can feel sorry for me. I was, uh, but no. Uh, that building right there that you're seeing with the big door, that is the, the, for the tanker, the, for the fire tanker for, to reduce the, uh, the rating. Landfill Road, uh, this week uh, we had our pre-con meeting, um, so uh, they're going ahead with permitting for this so we can start construction um, ASAP. So this is the last of the four to go through this process, so we'll be in a, a, a construction for all four of them. Here is uh, the Rockvale Center, and as you can see, the Rockvale Center's changed a little bit from, from last month to this month. They've erected the buildings and, and, and have the, the concrete poured for the, there. This is on the phase one side, the, that's opposite the current operating. The way this one will work is they'll get this one all the way completed, asphalt and, and, and power on, and then we'll move all of our operation over to that center while they work on the other side. So, um, so that's coming along quite nicely. And that's a, a look at the building from the, from the awning. This is also from this morning at, uh, at the Smyrna Center. As you can see, we now have uh, the slabs. These are the slabs poured for the, for the container laydown area. They're not the slabs for the, for the uh, compactors in the building yet. Anything else? If you could refresh my memory, that Smyrna site that you said, how close is that to Amarillo Road? Road? The Weekly Lane Center, the, uh, it's approximately six miles. 
And how close is the Amarillo Road site to the Smyrna city limits? Um, it is fairly close. I mean, it's probably a couple miles. No, the uh, solution could be call Smyrna. You know, it, it, it may be an issue that we need to get help from Smyrna, the city there. So I don't, if it's not in the city, it probably wouldn't work. But Laverne uh, seems to be working with us uh, to solve some of the problems. But, and, and it did, Smyrna did the same thing, you know. So if, if, if we're getting a lot of calls, I'm, I'll, I'm assuming a lot of that garbage that's uh, going to that Amberville site is coming out of Smyrna. So, you know, it, it'd be neat if Smyrna were to partner with us as to helping solve some of that, some of that problem. I, I would love to entertain ideas as such. I, I, I don't know if you could make, make that work, but s sometimes it, it, it would, it would help if, if, if Smyrna, Laverne, Burra, uh, and, and I know some of them are, but, and I was just wondering how close that Amable site was to the city limits, and it's fairly close. Yes, sir. All right, thank you for the update. If I may. Bishop, go ahead. Yes, sir. Bishop, uh, what is the footprint out there on Wakely Lane for that convenience center under construction? I know the total lot size out there is 18.22 acres. It's right at five acres. Five acres? Yes, sir. Thank you. Anthony? I'd like to straighten out the word on the street. What I've been hearing from several people, and I just want to know if you can just tell us how it is. Convenience centers are closing while the trucks are moving the compactor. Well, yeah, yes. the compactor. Yes, that, that's absolutely correct, and that is on, on my directive. Um, these, these compactor boxes, as, as I told you before, are, are approaching 20 tons. Um, when we're lifting up anything that's that heavy, um, I have ordered all of my staff to steer clear of these. Uh, the only person that's within truck length of them is the operator while he's picking up the box. Um, some, uh, some of the centers we had to do, the smaller centers, we've been doing this for, for b before I got here. I've just implemented this rule as a rule to all of these while we're dealing with these large compactors. Um, as the compactors get to all of the other centers as well, we're gonna see these gate closures while we're doing swaps. An average swap is between 10 and 15 minutes if, if everything's cleared out. Um, and, uh, and yes, it's a, it is, you know, unfortunate if you're if you're next in line, but it's it's for that it's for the the safety of the citizens and and my employees. Are the new designs designed so you don't have to do that? I don't foresee us being able to operate with these high. I don't feel comfortable picking up something that heavy. Uh, we're if that breaks, if that cable breaks and there are people around, somebody's gonna get killed. So the drivers are trained to stay in a way that, to stay away from, from those danger areas. But um, in some of the centers I've, I've noticed, people don't pay attention unless they're forced to pay attention to the fact that the truck's picking up boxes and all the people come and walking behind them and I'm not willing to risk the lives of a citizen for that. So we're gonna, we're gonna keep to that, that safety um, protocol for, for the foreseeable future. Have you posted your holiday schedule yet for times on and off? I, I have not. I'm st I've got a question out. I'm going to talk with the mayor about uh, the possibility of, of, uh, of Christmas Eve because this is a strange holiday. It falls on a, on a Sunday um, and a Saturday and Sunday are days I can't collect. So we're going to see if we can't figure, or I can't dispose. Or well, Saturday I can dispose for half a day. So maybe we can try to get some of my staff off a little bit earlier on that Saturday. We plan on being open uh, on, on Monday, running as, as normal to, to do our cleanups. And then Tuesday um, will be a, a regular, probably the busiest trash pickup day of the year. New Year's the same one? Yes. Uh, New Year's Eve we probably won't, won't ask to have off. We'll probably work New Year's Eve. Would it be possible like the animal site to put a couple of more open top boxes down there for bag trash only to try to get some of that traffic in off the road and you could get it as you could? 
So the, there's a problem with bag trash in open top containers. Uh, well, there's two problems. One is they f I can fill up a bag uh, open top container with bag trash in about two hours, and and if I get, they have to be pulled. They've they're the uh, wet garbage has to be pulled within 24 hours, has to be disposed of within 24 hours. I can't leave it in a site or we'll have vectors and things inside of it. So that puts a burden on my ability to operate on the other 13 centers that I have there. So if I have, if there's an emergency situation, what we do is we'll, to extend the life for that two hours, we'll say, okay, you can go in an open top for, for the two hours, but what happens then is my truck is dedicated to go back there to make sure that that to that MSW is taken care of and disposed of. So it's, we don't really gain anything by doing that. It just, it ends up really messing us up in other areas. Um, so if, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the trucks there and time the trucks with these new compactors who don't, they don't work in the same way as the old ones with the pressure gauge on them. Uh, they, they have a pressure gauge, but it's inside of the box. It's for maintenance purposes. They have a light, so when they're at 80 80 percent, the light comes on, and they call us in at 80 percent. It takes a little while when a, with a new attendant to learn the machine, the so sounds it makes, the way that it's it's compacting, in order for them to kind of give us a little bit more heads up to be able to get a truck in there out there to swap them out ahead of time. Um, so far, we've been doing really really good with that, and we're getting good weights in on it, but. Uh, but I, I hope that answers your question. It, I would love to be able to do that, but it ends up causing uh, problems all over the county when I start when I start filling up cans with uh, with bagged waste. All right, Bishop. What else? That's all I have. Any other questions for Bishop? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, item number six. Uh, is, has been pulled, other than I, I will give a brief broad brush discussion. Uh, item number six is called Presentation by Darren Gore on Potential Partnership on Transfer Station, uh, Material Handling and Gasification Campus. Uh, I, I pulled this because it was too premature. There'll be, there would be a lot of questions about this that the county is just not ready to answer and doesn't have the capacity to answer at this point. But the key word in that line is potential partnership. Uh, for those of you that watch the city government process, uh, Darren Gore, uh, his, the last city council meeting a few days ago, he proposed to the council uh, a, a potential interlocal agreement uh, with the county uh, on phase one of, or part one of four parts. Parts two, three, and four relate to their uh, pursuit of the agreement with Waste Away on the, the two and a half million dollar expenditure on the design and the process going forward. Uh, for the design and build of the waste away facility, uh, which will be their part of the material handling and then turning that material into the gasification process. So again, of the four parts they proposed, part one only, which is what they called material handling facility, which we call a transfer station. Uh, they had come to, the two mayors got together and, and potentially talked about a partnership on that. Uh, it would be on the south side on their Butler property uh, is where they're going to put that facility. Uh, it, they are going to provide the water and sewer. They would uh, give us the property and give is not the proper term, but it would be a long, you know, dollar a year lease uh, for the property. We would split the cost of the construction. Uh, in turn, they would split the cost with us on our north side transfer station. So this was just an early say, hey, we, we need to build our deal on the south side. You need a transfer station. Let's not double the efforts of construction and design. We'll split the cost on the south one. 
we'll turn around and split the cost on the north one with you. What do you think? Well, uh, on the surface, that sounds pretty good. And, th and that's where we are, on the surface. So there's a lot to be discussed, uh, but Darren went ahead and pitched that to the city council. Um, and so that was out there. I didn't want anybody to get alarmed that A, we have reached some agreement with the city with Waste Away. That is absolutely not the case. All this is is a four-parter with parts two, three, and four is the city's part with Waste Away. Part one would be the transfer station, which would be ours. We'd partially fund it. They would give us the land. They would bring water and sewer to it. To it. They would help with the design and construction, and that would be it. So that's as simple as I can say it. Um, much discussion to be had between the mayors and the attorneys prior to ever this even coming back to us for discussion. But Anthony, go ahead if you have a question. Since this was premature, but it has been mentioned waste away. Um, I'm for whatever will work. I'm excited about yeah. doing something that's going to get the job done, fix the problem. Uh, I would like to see Waste Away come and do a presentation to us, this committee, next month. So we're on the same page with Murfreesboro. We're all in the dark with Waste Away. And to do an agreement with Murfreesboro or anybody else, that's considering a company, I think we need to be informed about this company. Uh, I know when I was up here before, years ago, we looked at Waste Away and we didn't do it. It wasn't working. I've been reading that Waste Away is the cutting edge. Well, we looked at them probably 20 years ago. So, you know, I don't, I'm willing to look again. Sure. Well, l let me let me give you note, and that's not a bad idea. L let me give you a little bit of history on Waste Away. They they have been to our committee a, a few times during the RFI and RFP phase in the last 18, 24 months. But even since then, even since their last presentation to us, uh, their their philosophy has changed uh, where they were targeting uh, cement kilns uh, for burning. First, they were targeting TVA to burn as a substitute for coal. Uh, TVA has slow walked that uh, to a point that they had to look for some other options. Uh, while that is still on the table, TVA is moving at, a, at glacier speed. The, the cement kiln thing is still in play. The cement kilns are very much like the process. They have done test burns in Chattanooga at, the, at one of the cement company's kilns, and the results have been uh, as expected, if not better. Uh, but still, they're, they're trying to improve more. The, the, the latest thing is uh, take this material to a gasification. And uh, I, I am not, my bandwidth is not broad enough to discuss how that works. And it would be nice to have Waste Away come and discuss that with us on this new venture. Uh, I know the city is very interested in it also because uh, there's some real um, federal incentives to do that. Uh, you know, we talked, Mike talked about grants, potential for uh, uh, our transfer station. The, the feds talk in terms of credits. So uh, the more you can turn this into a gas, the more credits you get, which in turn brings dollars back to the table. So cities looking at it as a huge uh, revenue potential uh, so, again, I'm, I'm already out talking my bandwidth on that, but 
if it if it's the pleasure of the committee, I'm I'm happy to give them an invite back to give an update on what their what their uh, goal is. But the city is is very much. Um, it, it, I mean. They've talked about it for a long time, but now they've asked the council for two and a half million dollars to proceed with design. So they have made that giant leap forward. So uh, it's safe to say that this is their destiny at this point. Mayor? A couple of things. <clears throat> the waste to waste solution on the current model requires uh, 140,000 tons uh, a year of MSW for it to work. Uh, for e it to work economically. The reason, one of the reasons Murfreesboro is interested in partnering with Rutherford County's transfer station, they're not interested in p us partnering with them on the waste away, they're interested in partnering with us on the transfer station because currently between Rutherford County and Murfreesboro, that's about 100,000 tons a year of MSW. So that they, Mur what Murfreesboro wants to do this and to achieve these t uh, energy tax credits is the trash, the MSW that's created by Rutherford County. And so we, they want that literally diverted on the same campus to their waste away once it passes through our transfer station. So it's right now Rutherford County, at least the office of the mayor, is not looking at waste away as a solution in so much at, or for so long as Murfreesboro is doing it because the, we wouldn't have the capacity to do so, if that makes any sense. Now, downstream, as Rutherford County continues to grow, and we need other solutions to divert, and we will, we're going to find diversion technologies to keep it out of the landfill, regardless of what that landfill, where that landfill is located. We just have an environmental responsibility to do that, right? So we're, that's that is our intent. But as Commissioner Piercy has been quoted as saying many, many times, and I completely agree with them, until we build a transfer station, we can't quantify what we have. And the first thing we have to do is we've got to quantify what our trash is here in Rutherford County. So that's what a transfer station does. Where it goes after it leaves the transfer station, whether it's to a facility for Murfreesboro or another landfill city facility is yet to be determined. We're certainly very interested in hearing what Murfreesboro has to say about it because obviously transportation costs would be a lot different going next door than it would be some facility 30, 40 miles away. So we're very interested in seeing what they have to say on it. The, 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 gray, the gray area is starting to become a little more clear, but uh, there, there's still a lot on our end to, yeah. to figure out. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I know we... I know it's been removed from the agenda uh, for discussion, but yeah. one comment. Yes, sir. Conversation is always good. Yes. Especially with the city of Murfreesboro. We've not seen eye to eye on a lot of things, but conversation is good. Maybe we can get pointed in a, in a similar direction. So it, it's good, and I commend yeah. us for at least considering that. Oh, ab absolutely, Commissioner. Um, there's so much more we can do by working together um, and working through our disagreements, and, and we have them. That's not a secret, but they never should our disagreements be an obstacle uh, to, to the good. And so that's, that's, that's what we're pursuing. We're trying to find that common ground, and I think, we'll, I think we'll get there. I just don't know what it looks like yet. I do want to say one thing about partnering with Murfreesboro or any other municipality in this regard. Rutherford County has the statutory obligation to deal with trash, not the municipalities. So we have, when it comes to an interlocal agreement, that is our responsibility by state statute. And so that has to be at the center of any interlocal agreement. And so until we get our handle on that a little bit, we're just going to, we're going to be deliberate. Yeah. There, there's a lot of attorney speak that has to go on before we can really go to that next, go to that next step. Yeah, we are in a very good place. Um, and we keep talking about Murfreesboro, but we have got, and th this is the part we haven't got our hands around yet, we have got to get Smyrna, Laverne, Eagleville, we have got to get them engaged with us. That, that, that's a harder nut to crack to this point, but we've got to get them engaged. But it's on the list, it's on the to-do list. Um, anything else, old business, other business, anything you'd like to chat about, Steve? For the new commissioners that haven't had the opportunity to tour Waste Away, I'm sure they'd be more than glad to have them. 
it's it's very interesting yeah and you know they explain the whole the whole thing and it's it's pretty good too it, it is pretty cool it's, it's a it's a neat process and if you'd like you want me to invite mike webb if he can come next month and present or as soon as possible he can come and present is that okay with the committee can i can i grant can i grant anthony's wishes do you guys have a problem with that i personally would be happy to see him for the fourth or fifth time yeah but i want to well i'm serious <clears throat> um i want to hear about the gasification you know i want to hear about the gasification yeah, yeah. that they uh process yeah you know i've seen what they've had you know and two while you're in uh asking for that invitation i've got some questions for them and you can go ahead and give them to them yeah if uh you, i can see you after the meeting okay. with the questions so perfect perfect all right all right we'll do any other business old business all right we will see you in january yeah. rachel all right merry christmas January 3rd, mark it down. Merry Christmas, everybody. Of course, I'll see you all before then, but never hurts to say it. Thank you all. Meeting adjourned.